Hey there, how's it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward. And today I'm doing something a little bit different with the live video chat, just trying to play around with different camera angles and stuff. But uh, today's chat, we're going to be discussing bodybuilding and building muscle for men over 40. And this is kind of where I'm transitioning into with my videos, with my content, and with my own personal training, because that's where I'm at right now. And Lee Hayward's Total Fitness Bodybuilding is basically, it's, it's a personality-based uh, business. I mean, it's a business where I've shared my own journey and helping people along the way while also helping myself. That's the way that this program works. So when I started off back in the, you know, I started my first website back in 1997. It wasn't Lee Hayward's Total Fitness Bodybuilding back then. It was, it was a different site, but I started my uh, main site, LeeHayward.com, in 99. And then just from there, it transitioned. So, I mean, as I was into competitive bodybuilding, I went on with that. When I got into powerlifting around the early 2000s, I had several videos about powerlifting and my focus was on that. And it's just kind of evolved as I've evolved. And I still love all those things, you know, building muscle, powerlifting. And, and you know, I can relate to the, to the young guys who are struggling to get bigger and stronger. And that's your main focus. But now... Uh, there's a there's a new dimension to this. It's coming on to the point now where we're uh, I'm over 40 now and I can relate to a different set of challenges. And this is the challenges of trying to not just get in shape for the whole idea of being bigger and stronger, but to get in shape for my family, to be a positive role model to my son and to kind of it takes a different level of commitment at this stage. I don't have all the time in the world to work out for hours on end like I did when I was younger. So now it's it has to be more efficient, more scheduled, more structured, and trying to get the most bang for your buck, so to speak, and to get the most efficient workouts while on a tight schedule. So I've really changed a lot over the years with my own training. I changed a lot with my nutrition as well. And it's, it's interesting to see the, the transition because the diet and training that I followed when I was, you know, a teenager getting started and the, that's changed as I went into my 20s, the, the diet and training. As I got into my 30s, I found that I had to change it again in order to keep progressing. And now I'm sure as I get into my 40s and beyond, it's going to change and evolve again. So it's, it's interesting to see how that changes and how you, your metabolism changes and your body and all that. So. We're going to focus today primarily on strategies to help men over 40. Uh, and when I say over 40, I mean this 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond. I, mean, I know we got someone here joining and just said, hey, 60 years old here. We got Christopher joining. Uh, so I'm talking about a more mature male. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Someone who's been through uh, some ups and downs. You probably have a few aches and pains. You, you've probably been through the, the ringer a bit. So you need... Uh, a more of a strategic plan in order to continue to progress without causing future joint pains and aches and injuries and to kind of work around those things. So uh, before I get into this, I, I, I usually start off with this, but I didn't do it. I want to make sure that this is coming through loud and clear. So <laughs> before I go any further, can I just get a thumbs up if this is coming through loud and clear? All right, I got to do that. Okay, let's see. Think it is. Think it is. Good stuff. All right. I, I always do that with the start of my video chat. So you kind of got carried away and started into talking about the content here before I actually uh, did my audio video check. So let's jump into this. Um, <clears throat> so we got some different questions here. If you have anything in, anything in particular that you would like to ask with regards to training, with regards to nutrition, injury prevention, things like that, feel free to post those questions, comments into the chat window, and I'll be more than happy to help you out. And while I'm waiting for some of those uh, questions and comments to come through, I'm just going to share some of the, the differences that I've noticed in my own training over the years. Um, when I was younger, and I'm talking about like in my teens, because I actually started working out at 12 years old. And I know some people say, well, isn't that too young? It depends. I mean, obviously, that's too young for someone to try and be doing serious like powerlifting or something like that. I wouldn't recommend like a 12 year old to be, you know, trying to squat you know, double their body weight or stuff, something like that. But as far as physical fitness is concerned, I mean, you can start even earlier than that. To give you a prime example, my son is two years old and we have him in gymnastics. 
Now, gymnastics for a two-year-old is not very structured. It's kind of like playing around on the mats and, and bouncing on the trampoline and, and doing all kinds of fun stuff. You're basically just physically active and playing in, in the gymnastics gym, but it's laying the foundation for future physical development. I mean, as he gets older and as he starts to learn and develop his body more, then he'll be taking on more challenges. But you can start very young, start physical fitness from a very young age and progress gradually as long as you're doing it smart. I mean, obviously, you're not going to put people into a, a position where they're going to get themselves injured right off the get-go. But as, you know, when I started at 12 years old, that was when I started weight training. And I, I worked out with my dad and we started off in a basement home gym, just doing a little total body workout. And that's how it got started. Now, as I picked up the momentum and started to get uh, excited by bodybuilding, then my volume of training picked up. And I can remember like thinking, well, if, if a, a short little workout is good, then maybe a, a longer workout is better. Or maybe if three days a week is good, then what if I worked out every single day? And I had this mentality that more was better. And I can remember in my teenage years, you can, you can probably hear my son. He just woke up and I probably woke him up from my talking. He doesn't sound like a happy camper right now. Oh, shit. <laughs> Hopefully, mommy can soothe him. He's in there screeching. Oh, well, that's it. The show must go on. Poor little Harvey's in there. I'm sure mom will soothe him. Uh, anyway, let's let's get back to the question there or the, the topic at hand. I mean, say. What I found is, you know, the short little workouts that I was doing with my dad, like we did a total body workout three days a week. That's how we got started, following the York workout charts that came with our home gym. So we had these workout posters that we'd stick up on the walls and we'd follow the workouts. And it was a total body workout routine. Took us about 30 to 45 minutes to go through and did that three days a week. Now, for my dad, that that was perfect. He, he loved that because, again, it was a short, structured plan, you know in and out of the gym very quick. And I mean, he enjoyed working out, but it wasn't his whole life. I mean, he had a career, he was raising a family, he had other responsibilities than just working out all the time. Me, on the other hand, especially uh, during summer vacation, when we had the summers off, uh, I mean, I was just committed to working out. And I can remember going down in my little home gym and working out for hours at a time. And I had this mindset thinking, that, you know, the more I work out, the more muscle I'm gonna build. and I can remember doing like marathon four hour long workouts. I mean, thinking back at it now, it's absurd. And I don't even know how I managed to do it. But that was my mentality. And crazy enough, I actually made progress doing that as a teenager, doing these ridiculously long workouts. I did make some progress, but it wasn't optimal, right? I mean, it was progress, but it wasn't optimal progress. Then I got around some uh, competitive bodybuilders because it was around at the age 17 when I started competing. And I started hanging around some people who were more seasoned, guys who were in their 20s and 30s and had been competing on the local level. And they kind of took me under their wing and showed me, you know, some things that I was doing wrong and helped me with my workouts and helped me with my nutrition, and helped guide me in the right direction. And one of the things was obviously having a more structured program, scaling back on the ridiculous amount of volume I was doing, uh, having more structure to my nutrition. And by doing that, things just started to happen. I started to make really good gains throughout my late teenage years, early 20s. The gains I made then were phenomenal. I mean, I, I can literally remember uh, in college, uh, I was started college, I was 170 pounds. And when I finished, I was somewhere around, I think it was around 210 or 215 pounds. So I had literally, over the course of, of my years in college, put on 40 pounds of muscular body weight. And everybody in college was saying, oh, Lee's taking something. He's on steroids. I mean, look how big he's after getting. And that was totally natural. Those were natural gains made just from hard work and from proper nutrition. And for those of you who followed some of my programs in the past, uh, one of the key plans that I was following during this time was the cycle bulking diet, where it was a strategic plan of alternating phases of a, being in a high calorie surplus, uh, followed by like a little mini cutting phase to help reset your, your body, help to trim off any excess fat you gained, and to reprime it for the next uh, high calorie surplus phase. So it's an alternating uh, a bulking and cutting phase in a strategic fashion, the cycle bulking diet. And that's what I use to pack on 40 pounds of muscular body weight while I was in college and did so totally naturally. So that was a, a big boost for me. And then I got into more serious competitive bodybuilding, competed almost every year throughout my 20s. 
at age 28, I won my first bodybuilding show. Actually, it was my first and only bodybuilding show. Uh, it was a provincial show, the, the HWC. Uh, it was in 2007, I believe it was. I won the light heavyweight division and overall title at that show. And then went on to compete like at the Atlantics, the Atlantic Canadians. I did that for a couple of years. And my most recent competition was in 2011. So throughout my 20s and throughout my early 30s, my big goal was bodybuilding. Like my whole year was structured around off-season bulking, pre-contest cutting, and getting better for each bodybuilding competition. That was my main focus. I also had a little break in there where uh, I did powerlifting for a couple of years in the mid 2000s or 2004, 2005, I focused on powerlifting. Uh, but I kind of tied that in with bodybuilding because my off season bodybuilding was kind of like in season powerlifting, if that makes sense. So it, it can complement one another. And you'll actually find that a lot of the best bodybuilders do have a powerlifting background, you know, because powerlifting does help to build that thick, dense muscle. I mean, prime example, former Mr. Olympia, Ronnie Coleman. He was he started off as a powerlifter before he ever was a bodybuilder. Uh, Branch Warren, same thing. Um, you know, a lot of Arnold Schwarzenegger started off as a powerlifter, right? You know, so a lot of these guys have powerlifting backgrounds. Now, actually with Arnold, I'm not sure if he started off as a powerlifter or if he did powerlifting while he was bodybuilding, but still he has a powerlifting background in there. And you'll see that as a commonality amongst most uh, competitive bodybuilders who have succeeded at the high level. They usually do have a power background in there, some sort of power training, strongman training, something like that to lay the foundation. So I did that for a while in, 2000, in the mid-2000s, worked out well, um, and I, I competed in powerlifting as well during that time. But as I've gotten a bit older, what I found now is my priorities have changed from purely the athletic side of things to now it's managing business and besides my online business i mean i do online coaching and i i do uh, fitness various fitness ventures obviously you're following along with this online but in the quote unquote real world <laughs> i also do uh, property management and i own several real estate uh, investments and i have several rental properties and i manage that as well so that's what i do outside in the real world and that along with now having a new son it's just to the point where I don't have the endless time to really focus on bodybuilding as an athlete like I did before. You know, this whole idea of working up for several hours a day and having all the time in the world to prepare and structure my meals and track my macros and, and all that kind of stuff. It's I'm not doing that to the same degree. So I'm kind of following a modified version, focusing on the key elements that are needed to still move me in the right direction, but to do so as efficiently as possible and also to try and do it as safely as possible because over the years I've suffered my share of injuries as well. And I'm talking about like uh, I've torn both biceps, I've had shoulder problems, hip problems, knee problems, usually from trying to lift too heavy. You know, that's the root cause of most of it. Uh, although some of those injuries were totally non gym related. I mean, I remember like uh, I tore one of my biceps in a surfing accident that um, while I was on vacation down in Mexico back in, I think it was in 2011 it was, I was trying to surf. I can't say I'm a surfer, but I was taking surf lessons and I could actually, you know, stand up on the board and, and catch a couple waves with the help of an instructor. But anyway, I, I got swept up in one wave and I just tensed up and I grabbed my surfboard and while I was getting rolled into the wave, and what happened is to just the power of the wave jerked my arms and the board away from me. And as it did, it popped my bicep. So I actually tore my bicep as the surfboard jerked out of my arms in the wave. And uh, so that was a, a kind of a freak non-gym related accident. I had another one where I was mountain biking, wiped out, and I kind of screwed up my hip for the better part of the year. Like I couldn't really train legs for almost a full year because of that. But most of the injuries and aches and pains that I've had were actually my own stupidity in the gym by trying to lift too much, you know, push myself too hard and not allow for enough recovery. So I've learned to be more respectful of my body and pay attention to those little cues so that if I do sense that, you know, this is a, an injury that's possibly waiting to happen. Like I, I get these little cues and I'm, I've kind of gotten in tune with my body over the years where I know that, Hey, today is not the day today. I'm going to stop this set short of failure. or I'm going to scrap this exercise. I'm going to do something else, but I've kind of gotten that, 
a sensory acuity where I know that today is not the day for this. And I'd, I'd much rather scrap an exercise or scrap a workout and live to lift another day than try and push myself and, you know, tough it out, man, and, you know, like try and be tough and man it out and, and end up getting injured because I'm going to tell you right now, there's nothing going to set your training progress back further than getting injured. I mean, if you skip a workout in the greater scheme of things, it's not going to slow your progress down. You know, it's not necessarily going to help it, but it's not going to slow it down. If you skip an exercise or, I mean, if you cheat on your diet or something like that, I mean, it's not really going to set you back. I mean, it's not going to help you progress, but in the short term, it's not going to set you back. But if you push yourself too hard and get injured, not only is that preventing future progress, but it's going to set you back because you could be laid up with that injury for several weeks, several months. In some cases, it may never fully recover. So injury prevention is the number one thing that you need to focus on if you want to have longevity and long-term progress in the sport of bodybuilding and fitness. All right, so <laughs> there we go. That's kind of like a long-winded thing, and that's kind of like to, to share how I've transitioned over the years from the, the different mindsets and mentalities that I've gone through. So now I'm into this more mature, trying to be more efficient and smart about the training, and that's where I'm to right now, and that's where I'm trying to help others who are in that situation as well. So with that being said, I'm just going to jump into our chat window. I know we got a lot of guys joining us right now and a lot of questions coming through here. So I'm just going to uh, do my best to knock off as many of these questions as I can over the next 45 minutes or so. All right, let's see what we got. We've up here, we have Denner, uh, Denner Kareem. He's asking, does heavy weights hurt your heart? Does heavy lifting Shit, give me tongue tied here. I don't even have a drink of water here. Anyway, I'll keep going. Does lifting heavy weights hurt your heart? That's what Denner is asking. And no, I mean, within reason. I mean, if, if you are pushing yourself to the ultimate limit and straining yourself, yeah, that may place a lot of excess strain on your body. But bodybuilding, in terms of you know going into the gym and working out to improve your health and fitness. That's actually going to help to strengthen your heart. It's not going to place a lot of strain on it. But I know where you're getting at because there have been some uh, research studies that show that extremely heavy lifting, heavy exerting can actually place a lot of strain on the heart and probably even cause like little, you know, micro tears. I'd, I'd have to refresh my memory and look at these research studies, but I have seen them before where in extreme cases where you're pushing yourself to the absolute limit, you know, again, that extreme like one rep max power lifter on the platform going for a you know personal record or whatever doing that excessively and too much can place a lot of excess strain and not only on your heart but your entire body and that's why if you follow like even seasoned power lifters you know the top, the guys who are the top of their game they don't max out <laughs> too often if they probably max out like maybe once every few months or when they compete on the platform or something like that. It's not like going to the gym every week maxing out because your, your body just can't recover from that. You know, so uh, does extremely heavy lifting hurt your heart? No, not if it's done properly. But again, if it's done, if it's abused, yeah, you can place strain on your heart as well as your whole body in general. That's why you got to be smart about it. All right, moving on. We've got Josh here, and he says, Lee, when weighing meals, particularly meat, is it best to weigh raw or after it's cooked? Josh, you can do that both ways. Uh, you, you, can, you can measure your, your foods uh, raw or cooked, but what you need to factor in is the nutritional value based on the raw weight or the cooked weight. And there's a resource I like to use. It's called calorieking.com, and this is just a searchable database where you can type in whatever it is. Like, let's just say chicken. Right, good old chicken, a staple in most bodybuilding and fitness diets. Uh, you can type in chicken breast, and you can select cooked or raw, and you can calculate your macros based on whatever it is. So let's just say you're you're cooking up a meal and you have, uh, you know, a raw chicken, and you're you can say, okay, I want to calculate my macros based on six ounces of raw chicken breasts, right? Before I throw it in the pan or before I put it on the George Foreman grill or whatever it is, I want to know what's the protein car or there's no carbs in it, but what's the protein and the calories in this chicken? And vice versa, if you have some already cooked and now you're eating leftovers, then you can just calculate the macros based on the cooked weight. 
So you can do it both ways, it's just a matter of, of getting the correct information for the raw weight and the cooked weight. And again, calorieking.com is one that I use. I mean, there's a lot of them out there. That's that's just one that I've kind of stuck with over the years because I, I like it. But you know, there's a gazillion of these different food databases out there that you can search for and get this kind of information. So just go on Google and, and search for it. Okay, we have uh, Christopher's joining us. James is joining us. He wants, James is asking about the difference between creatine hydrochloride and monohydrate. Uh, ultimately, all the different creatines are going to do pretty much the same thing. I mean, there's, there's different forms of them, uh, but they all basically do the same thing. I mean, they help to uh, increase your muscle strength. They help to pull water and nutrients into the muscles and give you a bit more strength and energy in the gym. Uh, it, it's kind of personal preference which one you use. I, I personally stick with creatine monohydrate, uh, the micronized creatine monohydrate. I usually go for Crea Pure as the, the brand name because that tends to be the highest grade of creatine monohydrate and it's the most cost efficient and it just works. I mean, most of the studies, I would venture to say maybe 90 plus percent of the studies out there that are showing the positive benefits of creatine have been done on monohydrate. So if creatine monohydrate works, it's cost efficient. I mean, it, it delivers the results that creatine has become famous for, then why not just stick with creatine monohydrate? A lot of these other forms of creatine that you're seeing out there, a lot of it is marketing hype. And I'm telling you that because supplement companies they're trying to differentiate their products from one another. So, you know, if there's there's so many companies have a creatine monohydrate product. So, I mean, if the company wants to come out now and stand out from the competition, well, they have to try and, you know, reinvent the wheel or come up with something that's totally different. So now instead of this plain old creatine monohydrate, we got to have, you know, creatine hydrochloride, or we need to have crealkaline or, or what I mean, whatever other creatines that are out there. And Maybe they'll work for you. I mean, if you want to try it, there's certainly no harm in doing so. But I, I honestly think the best bang for your buck and what you're going to get just as good, if not better, results from is plain old micronized creatine monohydrate. Uh, Osen is joining us. Um, if I'm mispronouncing your name, I do apologize. But he's asking, uh, why is real food better than protein powder? All right, that's a good one. Uh, food in general is better than supplements. And I'm, I'm gonna use supplements instead of just protein powder because this applies to, to all different food supplements. I mean, whether it's a, you know, a, a protein or, or vitamin supplement or whatever, when you're getting your nutrition in its natural state, there's a lot of things there that we're not necessarily even aware of. I mean, nutrition is more complex than we're aware of. And it's getting more and more complex as scientists are un uncovering different enzymes and different phytochemicals and nutrients and stuff that we didn't even know existed. So, I mean, we're constantly uh, discovering new things. But the crazy thing is, the more basic you keep it, the more natural you keep it, the better it generally is. So, if you look at protein, let's just say you're talking about like meat, fish, eggs whatever, you know, typical protein foods, or even if you're talking about plant-based protein foods, same thing would apply. There's so much more in it than just protein, right? There's d different vitamins and minerals and enzymes and essential uh, fatty acids and essential amino acids and different <laughs> concoctions that we don't even know of that are found in natural foods that don't always get carried over in synthetic supplements. So, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything against protein powder. It's a great way to help bump up your overall protein intake. But I would try and get the majority of your protein, or at least a good chunk of it, from natural, unprocessed foods because there's so much more nutrition in real food than there is in just the supplemental form. And this applies for everything. Like some people think, well, I'm not going to eat vegetables. I'm going to pop a multivitamin. You know, I mean, yes, okay, you are getting some vitamins and minerals through your multivitamin supplement. But if you look at all the the phytochemicals and the plant sterols and the enzymes and the fiber and the nutrients and everything that you're getting through actual you know, fruits and vegetables that you wouldn't be getting through a multivitamin. I mean, again, not knocking the multivitamin. You can certainly take that as like an extra insurance policy to help make sure that you're getting you know, adequate vitamins and minerals. But don't think of it as a replacement. Think of it as just that. It's a supplement to help ensure that you're getting your adequate nutrition needs but don't think of it as a replacement. 
you know, you still want to base everything off the natural foods because that's what's going to fuel your body. That's what's going to give you the, the nutrition that you need to function and, and operate at your best. All right, Azim is joining us. Uh, it says he's 33 years old and he's been injured twice before. And talking about injuries, replying to that. And uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you've you learned the hard way. And, and when it comes to injuries, most people have to learn this the hard way. I mean, when I was younger, yes, intellectually I knew I could get injured, but it was almost like it's not going to happen to me until it did, right? I used to go in the gym and push myself, train to failure, sometimes skimp on the warm-ups because I always had in the back of my mind, it's not going to happen to me. You know, injuries are something that happened to somebody else until, you know, I've I started off just some minor injuries like maybe, you know, elbow tendonitis or a little strain on the shoulder from benching too heavy or something like that. But still, that wasn't enough until you actually get something that really sets you back, like a muscle tear or something that's like, oh, shit, this, you know, no longer is it just something that's going to take a few days to recover, but it's something that could potentially take a year or more to recover from. That's when you really get the wake up call and realize, OK, now I need to reevaluate things and train smarter and more efficiently and not just simply going in there with balls to the wall intensity thinking that I'm invincible because you're not. I mean, when you're younger, your joints, tendons and ligaments are more forgiving. They're more flexible. They can handle more abuse. As you get a bit older, things tend to stiffen up. It's just you, you get more fragile as you get older. You can't handle the same abuse that you did as a youngster. So uh, you have to be a bit more respectful the older you get. And, you know, that can even start in your 30s. It doesn't have to be for people over 40. I mean, this this can start, you know, much younger. And uh, speaking of injuries, we got Christopher joining us. He says he's had lots of injuries to work around from uh, uh, herniated discs, uh, he's had degenerated discs. Uh, what else? Carpal tunnel syndrome. I mean, he's got a whole list of some of the stuff that he's had to go through. Holy crap. Uh, shoulder separation man oh man he's been through the meat grinder anyway it's it's good that you're here <laughs> i mean uh, and, uh, and hopefully you're still able to train around these injuries and one of the things i recommend i mean if if you have an injury like something happens or something's causing aches and pains and discomfort and you just know it's not right instead of trying to self-diagnose it i'd recommend going to see your doctor or going to see a good physiotherapist who can help to analyze you in person you know, go through different movement patterns with you and find out exactly what it is that's causing you the pains and discomfort that you're experiencing. Because injuries can be very, uh, what's the word I'm trying to say, can be very, uh, I, I, can't, I can't think of the word I'm trying to say here, but it's, it, it, sometimes if you have an injury in one area, it may not be what you think it is. And, and I'll kind of give you a, a, an example that happened recently for me. I remember, like, I've always had uh, over the years uh, some mild carpal tunnel syndrome, and I've been able to manage it through stretching uh, and through different things. Like, you'll often see me, if you watch my workout videos, I'm wearing wrist wraps, or strap, yeah, wrist wraps, I should say. And uh, that's just to help support the wrists, and it helps to take some of the strain off the carpal tunnel, and also do various stretching exercises. I, I've shown these in some videos, and that has allowed me to train. Uh, around the carpal tunnel syndrome to maintain it so that it doesn't flare up and I haven't had to resort to surgery even though I know nowadays carpal tunnel surgery isn't as invasive as it used to be but still I, I if I can manage it without surgery and and get by I would prefer to go that route so that's one example uh, a, f a couple years ago I had an issue where all of a sudden I was getting this excruciating pain in my index finger and I was just I thought it was maybe is the carpal tunnel acting up or something like that but it was different. It was a different kind of pain. And it went on for a week or two, and it was just getting to the point where it's not getting any better. This is ridiculous. I don't know what I've got done. So I went to my doctor, and you know, he took me through a series of, of tests and stuff like that that he did. And what it turned out, there was nothing wrong with my finger. There was nothing wrong with my hands or anything. What it was was a nerve impingement in the back of my neck. And the nerve impingement in the back of my neck was obviously everything like all the nerves of your body travel down through your neck your spinal cord and i mean that basically has an uh, impact on your whole body and mobility so anyway the nerve impingement in my neck was traveling down through the shoulder down through the arm all the way to the index finger and causing this excruciating pain that was literally keeping me up at night and so what i he recommended was certain neck exercises and i was doing these neck exercises and that eased up the pain in my finger 
So sometimes if you're having injuries or aches and pains in certain parts of the body, that might be where you're experiencing the symptom, but it might not be the root cause. So for example, like you may have knee problems and you're thinking, oh, geez, my knees are killing me. What can I do to fix my knees? It might not be the knees at all. It might be something to do with your ankles. It might be something to do with your hips, your lower back or your alignment, or again, something to do with the spine. A lot of times you, what, where you're experiencing the pain, again, that's, that's where you're feeling it, but that's not necessarily the root cause. So that's why I recommend anytime you have injuries or aches or pains, especially stuff that's, that's been going on for any length of time, go get it checked out by a professional who can analyze and, and take you through different tests and mobility exercises to see what it is, because it may not be what you think it is. Again, the prime example, me with my, the, the finger pain, which ended up being a, an impinged nerve in my neck, right? Focus on the neck, fix the pain in the finger, <laughs> right? You could use that theory. I mean, that could apply to a lot of injuries that you may have. And so I would recommend getting it checked out by a professional rather than trying to self-diagnose yourself or, or just YouTube diagnose yourself by watching endless YouTube videos on it. Go get it checked out by a professional. And that's probably the shortest and quickest way to, uh, to recover from that. All right, let's move on. What else we got? So we have uh, Jesse's joining us. Uh, is there a difference between papaya digestive enzymes and regular digestive enzymes? There's a lot of enzymes out there that are classified as digestive enzymes. Um, papaya, I mean, it's a, a, a fruit which does help with digestion. But if you're looking at like some of these digestive enzyme supplements, they have uh, like protease for digesting protein. They have uh, lipase for digesting uh, fats. They have the least amylase for digesting carbohydrates. There's uh, lactase, I think it is, for digesting lactose. I mean, there's all these different enzymes. It's not just one enzyme. Uh, what most people have the trouble with, most average people, is protein is the hardest nutrient to digest hardest one to digest and break down and assimilate. So sometimes uh, you're not digesting it or fully getting the benefit of protein. So that's why it's good to have digestive enzymes with a lot of protease to help break down and absorb the protein, especially if you're following a high protein diet. So uh, you wouldn't get that through these, uh, like a papaya enzyme, for example. I mean, that'll help with general digestion and stuff. But if, if you want to really, you know, you need to figure out what it is that you have trouble digesting and what you need an optimization for. So if it's, for example, protein, something with a lot of protease is going to help you digest that. If it's a lactose intolerant, then you need something with lactase in it to help digest the lactose, right? It, it really depends on what it is that you have uh, issues with your digestion. And if it's just you want better overall digestion, then you can take like a digestive enzyme complex that has all these to just improve your overall digestion as well. All right, another question. This one's from James asking about what about a bad night's sleep due to disruptive nervous system resulting from heavy lifts and training? All right, what about a bad night's sleep due to a disrupted nervous system resulting from heavy lifts? Yeah, I, I can relate to that. I mean, if, if you push yourself extremely hard in the gym uh, for, for whatever reason, maybe it's, it's a crazy hard workout, or maybe it was some sort of competitive event that you were involved with. Uh, yeah, you can definitely stress your body out. Like you can feel that this it's almost like a, a delayed onset muscle soreness, but it's not just in the muscles. It's actually in your whole nervous system. So, I mean, you can actually feel like on edge, you can't relax. You're like too hyped up, too wired, whatever. I mean, yeah, I, I can relate to that, especially if it's something that you did, where you really exerted yourself over and beyond what you normally do. And, and usually what you re that requires is just taking some extra recovery time. You know, maybe factoring in some active recovery workouts in there, but it's usually just allowing your body to rest and recover so that you can overcome that issue. Um, one thing, this is, this is where you sometimes hear like people talking about like deload training phases, and it's kind of like the root cause of, 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 of overtraining. I mean, like if you overtrain yourself, then well, that's one of the side effects is a disrupted sleep because you just, again, your, your body is so stressed out that it can't fully relax and you need to kind of just back things off, back off the intensity with your workouts and give yourself that time to relax. You know, focus more on active recovery exercises rather than exercises that are going to stress you out. So for example, if, if I was going through a phase like this where I, I felt like 
my nervous system was stressed out. I just couldn't get a good night's sleep. I would probably lay off the heavy weight training and I'd do more active recovery exercise. Maybe things like getting outside in nature for walks, just going for gentle walks in nature. I find that that's very therapeutic, very rejuvenating because you go for a nice walk, especially if you can get out in the woods or on the beach or, or through some nice walking trails in a park or, or somewhere where you can breathe the fresh air and, and be in nature. That rejuvenates you. That makes you feel better. So at the end of it, you actually feel better than when you started versus like at the end of a hard weight training workout, you sometimes feel beat up and, and, and more exhausted than when you started. And that's typical of weight training. But when you do active recovery exercise like walking, you actually feel more rejuvenated. Another exercise I would recommend is yoga. I mean, I know this kind of sounds a bit sissy for some people, but yoga is actually, there's so many benefits to it. And I actually made a video about this a while back, it's something that I've been incorporating into my training as well. And it's a good, gentle form of exercise. It's still challenging mine. You don't get me wrong. It's, it's not an exercise for, for wimps. I mean, there's some of these yoga poses and postures are downright hard, but the, the mentality and, and the mindset that goes behind it, it's, it's, it's a gentle form of exercise. It's not, you don't have that grit your teeth intensity. It's more being, you know, being present in the moment, focusing on your breath. And it's a gentle form of exercise. That's almost like a de-stressor rather than adding stress, like going into the gym, doing like all out heavy set of squats. That's putting stress on your body. I mean, there's nothing relaxing about, you know, having a barbell on your back and squatting or deadlifting or whatever. That's stress. But yoga, some gentle cardio, some gentle walking, things like that, that's a gentle form of exercise. So if you're feeling the effects, you know, your nervous system's getting stressed out, you're feeling overtraining, I'd focus on more of these gentle active recovery forms of exercise until you're starting to feel better and then gradually implement back into the more uh, high intensity forms of exercise. But do so uh, where you're trying to maintain that balance where you're still recovering adequately and not overstressing your body in general. All right, let's move on. I know I sometimes get winded on some of these questions and get, get off on a tangent. So let's try and keep it to, uh, uh, to, to the question and move on here. Um, what do we got? Uh, Woodyos is joining us. Show Ab, I think. Um, please tell me two to three measurements that I should take to reduce my love handles and fat on my lower abdominal two to three measurements. I'm not sure if you actually mean measurements or do you mean like action steps or what, but um, you're gonna lose fat. When it comes to fat loss, typically for most guys, you're gonna see the fastest results in your uh, upper body, meaning your arms, your shoulders, your chest, uh, your legs as well. For most guys, that is, you're gonna see the fastest results there. So you will, it's common to see guys with lean arms, lean shoulders, lean legs, and then spare tire around the belly, right? You know, like they could have a roll of belly fat hanging over their belt, but they could have, you know, lean defined arms and lean defined legs. It's That's just the way it is. Most guys store their excess stubborn fat around the midsection. For women, it's sometimes different. Uh, a lot of times for women, they could probably get very lean and defined throughout the upper body, the midsection, and then in their lower body, you know, the hips and thighs, that's where they store a lot of the stubborn fat. And I, I can relate to this back when I was really focusing on training a lot of uh, competitive bodybuilders and figure competitors and physique competitors. I mean, I, st I still do it from time to time, but where I've kind of stepped back from, from bodybuilding competitively, uh, I don't have as many bodybuilding coaching clients anymore. But I remember back when I was training, and my wife, for example, I mean, I trained her to compete at the Canadian Nationals and figure. But her and a lot of other female clients that I used to coach, it was almost like two different bodies connected at the waist. You know, you could get a female competitor and she might be shredded with six pack abs from the waist up and she could have cellulite on her lower body from the waist down. I mean, it was it was so frustrating sometimes to see this. Uh, and, you know, that's typical of women. But in men, it's uh, usually you can be lean in the arms, shoulders, lean in the legs, but it's right around the belly. Now, the key here is to continue dieting longer, continue losing, trying to lose fat longer so that you tap into that stored stubborn body fat. It's not that you're necessarily doing anything wrong, but you just have to realize you have to diet longer in order to access that stubborn stuff, right? You're going to lose fat from the easy areas first, 
and you, it's going to take longer to get into that stubborn body fat. Now, there's some other things that you can do, provided your diet is on track, your training's on track, your cardio, you're, you're doing all the fundamentals, right? You're, you're in a caloric deficit, you're working out regularly, you're doing regular cardio, you have all the foundation in place. One of the things you can do to help speed up fat loss in a stubborn area is it kind of goes against conventional wisdom, but it's almost like spot reduction. And that's why you used to see some of the old time bodybuilders doing a lot of abdominal work and it worked for them. Like if you look at the old time bodybuilders, I'm talking about like in the pumping iron era of, you know, in the fifties and sixties and seventies, it was common for them to do like a lot, a lot of abdominal work. And you would see them, especially as they got closer to competition, doing ridiculous high volume ab workouts. And, you know, people would say nowadays, well, spot reduction is impossible, blah, blah, blah. And for the average person who's like overweight and out of shape, I mean, if, if you got 40 pounds of fat to lose, yes, you can spot reduce all you like. You're still got 40 pounds of fat to lose. It's not going to make any difference. But for someone who's already fairly lean and has the structure in place, like, you know, think of like a competitive bodybuilder who's just, you know, a couple months out from a competition, they've already got a relatively lean physique. They had the foundation of diet and training and everything in place. Then if they increase the volume to their stubborn body parts, then that increases more metabolic activity, more blood flow, more, more circulation. And it almost has a spot reduction type of effect where you can tighten up that area. So, for example, in the case of when I mentioned I was training some like female physique competitors and figure and bodybuilding competitors, if they had the physique where they were lean and shredded from the waist up, but they had stubborn fat in the waist down, we would increase the volume of their leg training. We'd increase the intensity of the cardio that they were doing to try and get more metabolic activity in their legs to help speed up fat loss. You can do the same thing if you have stubborn belly fat. You can do more abdominal training. You can do more work for your lower back. Uh, you can do more work just for your core in general to try and get more metabolic activity there, which then is going to in turn help to speed up fat loss. But it's only going to work if you already have the foundation in place, right? This is where it gets confusing with the spot reduction. Because like I say, you could have someone who's 40 pounds overweight. They're eating like crap. They're not doing any exercise. And then they think they can buy an ab gadget off TV and you know off a tv infomercial and do 100 sit-ups a day and they're going to lose all their belly fat no it's not going to work like that because they don't have the foundation in place first but if you have the foundation in place first you're already in a fat loss mode then adding in the extra uh, i guess spot reduction type exercises that can make a difference at that stage but it won't make a difference if that's all you do so hopefully that helps to uh, clarify that question all right, let's move on. We have Danners asking, how many sets and reps for one group of muscles per week? That's really going to vary depending on the individual. I mean, that that's like a wild card. That's like saying, you know, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> it depends, right? It really depends. So I'm not going to really dive into that too deep. Um, if, if you want to see some sample workout programs with sets and reps and all that, go to my YouTube channel and check it out. Like I have a playlist for all different muscle groups, you know, so you can go and see my chest workouts and see sample routines and arm workouts with sample routines and leg workouts and back workouts. And so you can actually follow on because in those playlists, there's full on body part workouts outlining the exact sets, reps, exercises, etc. So you could follow along with that. Or you could just head on over to my website and download the three keys to building muscle uh, e-report. Uh, it's, it's available on LeeHayward.com. That actually outlines a complete uh, workout program that you can follow along with as well. And it outlines, you know, the, the science and the mythology behind it. So, again, check that out. Uh, Woody Los is asking, how are you getting along with the anabolic reload program? I'm still using it. I'm still using it. I've kind of made a few little tweaks here and there with it, but I still follow the basic program. And the thing that I like so much about anabolic reload, it's it's just the theory behind it. It's it's a three day total body workout. Now the, the workouts will vary. So like you'll focus like day one, uh, will focus on a lot of leg exercises. Day two focuses a lot on arm exercises. Day three um, focuses more on some more of the heavy uh, heavier lifting exercises, but each one is still a total body workout. So you're still going to hit all your major muscle groups through each workout. And the thing I like about it is it's very uh, convenient for people who have a, a bit of a sporadic schedule. So like 
right now with my schedule and that I may not get to the gym as often as I like. Like sometimes I'll get to the gym, say, four times a week. Some other times it might only be twice a week. But if you're doing a total body workout, well, even if I'm only getting to the gym twice a week, I still hit each major muscle group twice per week, which is still plenty to help stimulate growth and to make progress. So that's one of the things I do like about it. Uh, the other thing I like about it is it's it's easy on the joints. You know, the, the sets and the reps and that are structured in such a way that you're pre-fatiguing your muscles first, doing a lot of high repetition work and stimulating the slow twitch muscle fibers before you get into the heavy lifting, and it's not as hard and jarring on the joints. I mean, since I've been following the anabolic reload program, I haven't had any aches or pains in my joints, no, no knee pain, no tendonitis, no nothing. You know, so I've been able to train consistently and pain-free. I mean, those are two, boom, boom, right? <laughs> I, I really enjoy that. So it's, it's a great program. I highly recommend it. And I do have more videos for the Anabolic Reload program. I, I just haven't gotten around to editing them all yet. <laughs> so I know I posted up a video showing the first workout. I actually have the other workouts already filmed and the videos are uploaded to, to my computer, but I haven't got them edited and voiced over and all that yet. So that's something that I'm going to uh, be working on within the next week or so. So hopefully you'll find, I, I'll tell you right now, I'll have within the next, uh, by next week, I'll have the second part posted, and then hopefully by the following week, I'll have the third part posted if you want to continue and follow along with those videos. But thanks for asking. I mean, it is, it's is—it's an awesome program, and I definitely highly recommend it, especially for guys who are, you know, 40 and above, and, you know, you're looking for a workout that's easy on the joints, and it's also uh, very accommodating for a busy schedule. Can It's definitely one you want to check out. So Anabolic Reload, uh, is it anabolicreload.com or... If you go to my main YouTube channel, I have the first workout there, the whole video, and there's also a link to check out the full program there as well. Jonas is joining us. Uh, pretty funny to look at Lee on his monitor. I know it is. I, I, I purposely set that up just so you can have a bit more visual something on the go. I don't know what the hell is this. I just tried to change it up, and the reason I changed this up is because last week, one of my good friends, uh, Kevin, sent me an email. He said, yeah, I've been watching your show. He said, it was a good show, but he says, that background, man, you got to do something. I'm just looking at this plain old wall behind you. And he's like, it's it's boring. He said, stick something up there. He said, put a backdrop up there or put something. Or He said, it, it just looks boring, me looking at that plain old wall. So I was thinking, hmm, what can I do here? And uh, I said, well, the easiest thing to do is just move the camera. And so it's not the wall, it's the bookshelf. And now I have this monitor here to provide a little bit more visual uh, variety for you. So it, it's a start. I mean, it's nothing too fancy or elaborate, but at least you're not looking at the plain old blank wall. <laughs> so that's why I did this. All right, moving on. Uh, Wayne is joining us. Is it impossible to do weighted pull-ups Oh, geez, never mind. He's, he's just being a. Moving on. I always get a few people like to throw in a stupid question. Well, I'll read it out anyway for the hell of it. Give Wayne a, give Wayne a chuckle. It says, is it, is it possible to do weighted pull-ups with Haley's Comet attached to you? All right. I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Uh, Vince Geronda's steak and eggs diet for max fat loss. Uh, That's what Joey says. He likes it. Um, it's basically a, a like a ketogenic, low carb diet. Um, it can definitely work. I've used various variations of low carb diets over the years, and I do find that they work. But from a practical, long term point of view, I'm personally not a huge fan of extremely low carb diets. A moderately low carb diet, yeah. I mean, what I personally like, and again, this is just what I find works well for me. And it, it just so happens that it works well for a lot of people that I coach as well. But one third protein, one third carbs, one third fat. That's just this well-balanced ratio. And it works. I mean, I know there's been other diets that have been very similar to that over the years, like the, the zone diet, I think was one um, had that similar type of ratio. But I just find that that works. When you have one third protein, one third carb, one third fat, it's easier to get satiated and satisfied with fewer calories because one of the problems I found and I've went through all extremes and I actually put up a blog post a while back explaining this but if you follow a very low carb diet even if you're eating high calories you'd still 
you feel that void from the low carbs. Vice versa, if you follow a very a low fat diet, you feel a void from the low fat. Like you, you need a certain amount of fat in you to have that satiation. You need a certain amount of carbs in you to have that satiation. And even if you go to the other extreme, you follow like a vegan or plant-based diet and you have a low protein diet, you, you feel the void there as well. And I've, I've actually went through an experiment a few years back where I went vegan and I was eating a low protein diet because I just wanted to see how it would work, you know, and it didn't work very well. <laughs> All right. And I, I mean, even though I was eating a lot of calories, in fact, probably borderline what should be a quote unquote calorie surplus, I was still losing weight following a vegan low protein diet. And the problem was it wasn't just losing weight. I was I wasn't getting any leaner, so I was losing lean muscular weight, and I actually felt flatter and fatter, if that makes sense. Like I wouldn't get a pump in the gym. I was just losing weight, but I still had that roll of belly fat hanging over the belt, and I didn't like it. So then when I went back to a balanced diet of, again, one-third protein, one-third carbs, one-third fat, had this well-rounded, it, it, my body just started to respond. I mean, I felt healthy. I felt satiated from my meals, and it just, I feel that... For most people, it's probably the best solution. Now, of course, there's there's extremes like there's like the 80-20 rule, right? You know, like 80% of the people are probably going to respond to it, but you're going to have the outskirts, you know, 20% who are going to respond to some crazy diet. That's why you'll see some people function really well on a crazy low carb diet, or other people function really well on like a, a vegan low protein diet. But th they're the exception; they're not the rule. Most people are going to function somewhere in the middle with a well-balanced diet. That's where most people are going to be at their best. So that kind of explains why you'll see these, these extreme cases from time to time, right, where people follow some weird, wacky diet and it works for them. But you can look at it like a bell curve, right? You know, most of the people are in the middle, right? Then you have, when you get to the extremes on either end, again, super low carb or super low protein or super low fat or whatever, that's usually the exception and not the rule. All right, let's move on. We've got uh, Raf joining us. He wants to eliminate skinny fat body. How many days a week should he lift? How many days a week should he do cardio? Um, again, that really depends. But if you're, if you're asking this question, I'm going to assume that you're probably in the beginner phase. And what I would recommend to, uh, to most beginners is to alternate weight training one day and cardio the next. Weight training one day, cardio the next. And that is a great schedule to keep you physically active on a daily basis, but it's also complementary forms of exercise. So you have the high intensity weight training one day, then some low intensity cardio the next. High intensity weight training one day, low intensity cardio the next. So you're giving your body a break in between. So you're not overstressing with weight training every day. You're actually giving it a break. And it's just, I like to refer to it as like yin and yang training. So, I mean, you, you get the benefits of the high intensity weight training, and then you get the active recovery and the fat burning benefits of the, the low intensity cardio after. So that's, it's a good way to structure your workouts. Uh, da, 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 let's see what else we got. 80s, baby, 90s kid. Uh, how do inmates with little or no equipment get bigger than people with unlimited resources in the free world? Uh, again, that's kind of like the exception, not the rule, or the, the, it's kind of like a stereotype as well, because I'm going to tell you, there's, even though, yeah, you will see, you know, prisoners or inmates who work out and are big and are strong and they're jacked and everything else. You're also going to see guys in there who are skinny and scrawny or fat and overweight. You're going to see them all shapes and sizes just like you will in the real world. So a lot of it has to do with genetics and a lot of it, um, I mean, again, you're going to see uh, similar patterns, right? Like it's not, it's not like everybody in jail <laughs> is, is, you know, huge bodybuilder or something like that. I know in the movies they kind of portray it that way, but in the real world, you're going to have people of all shapes and sizes, right? Tall, short, fat, thin, muscular, scrawny. You know, it's it's just that we kind of visualize that they're all huge and jacked. I mean, they're not all Cali muscles, right? He's the exception, not the rule. I mean, he's a genetic freak, right? Uh, I mean, not everybody's going to have that kind of uh, physique. <laughs>
Okay, Jesse's joining us. Uh, are you planning on uploading the other videos for the full body work that you recently put out? Yes, that's in the pipeline. I just mentioned it. The videos, they're already shot. They're already there. I just need to edit and voice them over and, you know, get around to doing it. So, yeah, they're in the pipeline. Uh, let's see what else we got. Now we got do it all saying coach i'm 39 i lost 13 pounds and i'm stuck at a plateau do you have any suggestions it it really depends on, on what you're doing and how you're stuck i mean if first off congratulations on losing 13 pounds that means you, you've obviously moved yourself in the right direction but as far as what to do from now on to bust out of that plateau i really need to know more about what it is that you're doing in terms of your, your diet your training and everything else and I'm just going to throw out some some different uh, scenarios to kind of explain why this is such an individual thing. For most people, if they hit a plateau, it, it's usually because they need to reduce their calories even further, right? They they either need to expend more calories through more exercise, or they need to lower their food intake to get more of a caloric deficit. One or the other. You know, they need to exercise more and eat less. Some combination of that or both. That For most people, the average person, that's going to move them in the right direction towards burning more fat. But it doesn't always work. Or that doesn't always work forever. <laughs> because if you take someone who's like very strict, uh, like let's say a competitive bodybuilder or physique competitor, I've seen the opposite happen where they're doing so much exercise they're, they're following this super low calorie diet and that actually slows their metabolism down and actually they hit a fat loss plateau because they're training too much and eating too little, right? It's the uh, kind of like it doesn't make sense when you think about it from a practical point of view because it, get, it goes against, you know, the mathematical numbers. is like if, if your calorie expenditure is up here and your caloric intake is down there, like why aren't you losing fat? It doesn't make sense. But I've literally seen it with some of the bodybuilders that I've coached over the years who are busting their ass, cardio, like an hour to two hours a day, plus weight training, plus posing practice, all while following a low carb, low calorie diet. And they're like, what's wrong? I'm not losing any, any more fat. I'm, I'm stuck at a plateau. And I've literally taken some of these people and I said, like, let's slash the volume of your workout. Let's increase your calories. Like, let's totally do like a like a, a reset for your metabolism. So I almost had them follow like a clean bulking program with low volume workouts, even cut out the cardio and just do that for maybe a week or two, depending on, on the circumstances, but do it for a short period of time. And that kind of just helps to reset their metabolic rate, helps to reset, you know, their, their all their, their bodily functions. Cause when you're on a low calorie diet, that lowers so many things. I mean, it lowers your thyroid, it lowers your leptin. I mean, it lowers testosterone and growth hormone. I mean, all your metabolic and anabolic hormones can get suppressed if you're pushing the limits and trying to do so on a low calorie diet. So by flipping it, you sometimes help to reset your body. You know, it's almost like a recharge. And then when they start to go back to their current routine after that reset, boom, they start losing fat again. So sometimes you need to go through these different changes. And again, where you're at right now, I don't know where that is for you because I need to discuss it with you to figure out, you know, what you're doing, where you're at, why you're stuck at a plateau in the first place. So I can't really just give you a cookie cutter, do this answer because it's really an individual thing. But I just kind of want to share that's why, right? There's there's so many variables that could be going on. But if this is something you'd like help with, then shoot me an email. I mean, head on over to my website, uh, send me an email. Um, I don't know if, if – YouTube is in the process of changing. I don't know if you can send private messages through YouTube anymore or not. You used to be able to, <laughs> but I don't think they, they offer that feature anymore. But you can send me an email. You can email me at leeh at leehayward.com. Again, that's leeh at leehayward.com. And uh, if you want, we can you know, have a chat and discuss what it is that you're doing and see if we can come up with some strategies that work for you. Uh, but again, uh, just thinking about it. I'm not sure if YouTube offers the, the private message feature anymore or not because I think it was, it was getting abused or, or at least not used properly, put it that way. So I'm not sure if that's still available. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, Chris, uh, Christopher is asking, or sorry, he's making a comment saying he's still training four to five days a week, but not nearly as heavy as he used to. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad to hear you're still consistent. And I mean, if it's not as heavy as you used to, 
that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? I mean, just as, as you get more mature and as your body changes, you know, sometimes your training priority has to change as well. Uh, Colin's joining us. He says, would proper nutrition and an uh, intermediate workout three times a week on your app produce gains? It certainly could be a, a step in the right direction. Uh, I mean, uh, as, as always, I need to know more about you specifically rather than just kind of giving you a cookie cutter yes or no answer. But it's probably a step in the right direction. I mean, if, if you're nothing else, try it and see how your body responds. And then, you know, let me know and we can always adjust it accordingly. And the cool thing is if you have the Total Fitness Bodybuilding app, which is available for both Apple and Android devices, there's a section there where you can ask me questions. Either on the app itself, there's a, a an Ask Lee section where you can post your questions publicly on the app. Or there's also a section there where you can contact me and send me a private message. So if you want to get in touch with me and discuss your own personal you know, training, nutrition situation, you can contact me through the Total Fitness Bodybuilding app as well. Uh, so again, just uh, I have a link to it on YouTube as well as on my main website. And I, I recommend you download it anyway. I mean, it's it's a, a awesome tool. It has some of my best programs in there. I mean, there's a lot of good foundational information. And it's going to be, I guarantee it'll be the best two bucks you ever spend. <laughs> That's how much it costs. It's a one-time $2 fee to download the Total Fitness Bodybuilding app. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised if you get a copy of it for yourself, or, or not necessarily a copy of it, but you download it for yourself. And if you do, I would recommend that if you leave me a positive review on iTunes or on the Google Play Store. It would mean a lot. All right, let's move on. Um, Mark saying, love your videos. Well done. Says he had a triple heart bypass 13 months ago. Feels great now, 57 years old. What would be your one best tip for building muscle for me? Whoa, okay. Well, first off, thanks for the, the compliment. And uh, I'm assuming you had a successful triple bypass. So congratulations on that. I mean, it's, it's definitely a, a, a scary to think. I mean, you're only 57 years old. And that's, you know, that, that's quite a major operation. But again, it's 13 months ago. So you, depending on what your doctor says, I'm sure you're probably good to go uh, but definitely if, if talk to your doctor first i gotta cover my butt here you know anytime before you start any diet or exercise program you should always talk to your doctor but if you had heart surgery definitely talk to your doctor before you go doing anything right get his okay to make sure everything's okay with your health and fitness and that you're strong enough to actually do this uh, but i would probably recommend what i did for the uh, a couple questions ago start off with uh, uh, you know, like a total body workout three days a week, and then on your off days from that, uh, do some low intensity cardio. So weight training one day, cardio the next, and do that in an alternate fashion. Uh, again, great way to keep yourself active, a uh, great way to get the benefits of both cardio and weight training, and that that's what I would recommend to start with. So that would be a, a good good general place to start. Uh, again, if if you wanted some more specific information, you want to kind of like to customize this. A specific plan of action for you along with the diet plan send me a message either through the total fitness bodybuilding app or email me and we can discuss that in more detail all right um, tracy is joining and says how do you lose fat without losing weight in order to lose fat without losing weight you'll have to simultaneously be building lean muscle in the process that may or may not be possible depending on the situation and it may not always balance out it's easier to lose fat than it is to build muscle all right to kind of put things in perspective if, if somebody is really strict with their nutrition like they could probably lose pretty much all their excess body fat within a year or less right provided you're within 50 pounds or less of your ideal body weight right you can realistically lose 50 pounds of body fat in a year that's like one pound a week, right? Very realistic, very healthy, very achievable for, for most people. However, to build that much muscle would take years, right? To put 50 pounds of muscle on your frame, I mean, that, that's usually like a lifetime of training for most people, especially a natural person to put on that much muscle. So it's quicker and easier to lose body fat than it is to build muscle. Now, when, when I say easier, I, I mean it. It's faster. I mean, it's it's still not easy to follow a calorie restricted diet and to to do the training and everything else. 
but it's it's faster, right? You can get faster results in fat loss than you can in muscle building. So in order to lose fat without losing weight, you would have to be simultaneously building muscle while losing fat at the same time. And it may not always balance out, right? Depending on how much fat you, you're losing, the, the weight may still drop, even though you're still adding lean muscle. Like for example, if you lost 10 pounds of body fat and put on five pounds of muscle, you still have a net loss of five pounds, right? Um, but what I recommend in, in a situation like this is to forget the pounds, forget the, you know, the everything like that, and focus on your performance in the gym. That's what I'd recommend. Like for people who want to recomposition themselves, sometimes we need to change our focus from the, the numbers on the scale to just focusing on your actual performance. So if you get stronger in the gym, if you improve your cardiovascular performance in the gym and you get more you know, explosive, more athletic, and you all the, the physical markers, if they improve while following a good sound nutrition program, you know, good quality uh, diet with a well-balanced, again, one-third protein, one-third carb, one-third fat, uh, eating at least a caloric maintenance or maybe even a slight caloric surplus in some cases, and just focus on uh, your performance, you can build muscle while burning fat. Because as your body gets stronger, as your body, you know, your endurance gets better, as you build yourself up physically, that's chances are the side effect of that is going to be more muscle and less fat on your frame. So that's what I typically recommend for a lot of people, especially sometimes I get a lot of younger people contacting me and saying like, Oh, I, I want to build muscle and lose fat simultaneously. What do I do? And so, you know, should I bulk? Should I cut? Should I this? Sometimes I say, forget bulking, forget cutting. Let's just eat a calorie maintenance and focus on getting in your best shape in terms of your physical performance. If you do that, that's kind of like the side effect is you're going to simultaneously recomposition your body in the process. Then as you get more advanced, right? Once you get past that initial beginner phase and you get more advanced and you hit a plateau from that initial beginner training phase, then we can decide what's the next best thing, whether it is to go on a lean mass bulking program or whether it is to go on to a more extreme fat cutting program. We can uh, adjust it from there, but you need to start with the foundation first. Okay, how are we doing for time? I'll answer another couple questions and we'll move on. Um, adaptive Android says, Lee, my pull-up game is weak. Will lat pull-downs help? <sighs> Technically, yes, it, it will help because you are working the same muscles. But I'm going to tell you from a practical point of view, getting strong at pull-downs is not always going to carry over to helping you get strong at pull-ups. If you want to get better at pull-ups, I would recommend focusing on the pull-up and different variations of the pull-up. So you could do assisted pull-ups, you could do negative pull-ups, you could do partial pull-ups. Uh, you could even do like an inverted row, which is a like a you know a, a pull-up with your feet elevated, right? You know, there's different things, but it, it's not the same mechanics, right? When you're doing a pull-up, you're putting your body into a natural three-dimensional movement where you're moving your entire body through space. When you're doing a lat pull-down, you're only moving your limbs. There's less muscle activation in a lat pull-down than there is in a pull-up, right? There's less neuromuscular activation going on. So if you want to get better at pull-ups, I would recommend doing different variations of pull-ups, whether that's assisted pull-ups on, on an assisted pull-up machine, assisted pull-ups using like a, a rubber fitness band where you, you use that to help support some of your weight, whether that's doing negative pull-ups where you drag a bench or a chair or something under the pull-up bar use your feet to assist you to the top and then just slowly lower yourself down under the negative resistance, focus on that. Or even if it's just partials where you only do uh, repetitions for as high as you can, even if you can't get your chin over the bar, it, even if you're just doing partial range of motion, that's another way to help improve your pull-up strength. But I would focus on the actual pull-ups themselves rather than the assistant exercises. Again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the assistant exercises. Don't, don't take this the wrong way, but to really focus on that specific exercise, you have to do that exercise and different variations of it. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Got a few uh, troll comments I'm not going to mention. Um, Okay, what else have we got here? Someone saying, Colin saying, I've heard moose meat has very little nutritional value. Any truth to this? Uh, moose meat is a very lean meat, but as far as nutritional value, I've, I mean, it's still, a, you know, a, 
a nutritionally dense meat just the same as you would get any meat. That's kind of more of a myth than a hard fact, but it is lean because usually if you're getting wild game, it tends to be leaner than, you know, uh, grain fed cattle on a farm that are, you know, fattened up with, with, with excessive food and hormones and all kinds of crap. When you're getting natural wild game, uh, it tends to be leaner. So that's sometimes where people will probably get the, the misconception that it's not as nutrition, not as nutritionally dense, but it's, it's usually not as chemically enhanced and artificially fattened up either. So I personally like eating, eating moose. I mean, I, I don't eat a lot of it, but, uh, because I'm not a hunter myself, but I have you know several uh, friends and family members who are. So very often we will get some uh, moose meat in the fall of the year. Actually, just uh, just the other week we had some moose sausages that uh, my uncle gave me. He uh, he went out and got a moose this year, and they were absolutely delicious. Oh man, they were good, right? But yeah, I do like moose meat uh, from time to time, and it is a great source of of lean protein. Uh, Mark saying thanks for your input. Appreciate it. Uh, Miguel is joining us. What kind of meals should I eat if I want to lose weight? Like what should I cut? What should I eat more of, etc.? Keep it simple here. Natural unprocessed foods. And I, I, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out how to move you in the right direction. Like whenever you sit down to a meal, look at, just look at it from a practical point of view. I mean, if, if your meal consists of uh, you know, a hamburger and French fries or pizza uh, or something, you know, processed, <laughs> then think of how can you swap that out for something more unprocessed, right? Uh, to give you an example, if you're eating French fries, well, what's a better alternative than a French fry? How about a baked potato, right? Boom, that's a better alternative than French fries. Um, if, if you're eating, like for breakfast, if you're eating box cereal, for breakfast, I don't know, like you're eating a bowl of cornflakes with like, what's a better alternative than that? How about a bowl of oatmeal, right? Something that's less processed, more nutritionally dense. You know, you can make these little swaps. It doesn't have to be like a major overhaul or like, you know, starving yourself or anything like that. Just thinking of making better food choices within you, the diet that you have now. And that'll move you in the right direction. I mean, that's a good step. I'm not saying it's going to be the ultimate step. You'll probably have to make further steps than that, but it's a darn good start. Uh, so just kind of look at, uh, for example, if, if you're eating, oh, uh, like chicken nuggets, you know, or, or breaded fish sticks or some processed foods like that. Think of, okay, what's a better alternative? Maybe if I just had, you know, chicken breast, you know, real fresh chicken breast, or instead of breaded fish sticks, maybe I just ate the, you know, the, the fish fillet itself, you know, a nice wild caught piece of salmon or wild caught codfish or, or whatever kind of fish. Think of it making natural choices. And if you, again, if you do that, that's the first step that I'd recommend to moving you in the right direction towards improving your diet. And by doing that, it's going to provide you with better quality nutrition for building muscle, and it's going to be less garbage calories. So it'll help, also help you with burning fat. So that's, that's step one. If you want the first step, that's step one. Okay, we have Wayne joining us. Uh, Carlos is joining us. And uh, Wayne says, you're a good sport. Thanks, Lee, for answering my question. You're welcome. Uh, we have Gaines asking, do you drink alcohol? Thoughts on alcohol and fat loss? Personally, I do not drink alcohol. I, I used to when I was younger. And... The only reason I did it was because it was kind of socially acceptable, right? I mean, I never ever bought alcohol for myself. Like, I never ever had brought alcohol into the house. But if we went out somewhere, like we went out to uh, a nightclub or if we went out to a house party or went somewhere like that and people were having drinks, then, yes, I would have a drink. If I went out to, you know, a, a nightclub or something, I would buy a drink and have it. Like, literally, I would have a couple social drinks, you know. I would always have it to the point where I was de the designated driver. And I used to use that as my excuse to not drink. So if I went out, if I had one or two drinks over the course of the night, that would be it. Right. And I would always say, well, I'm driving or whatever. Cause personally I didn't like alcohol. I mean, I, I didn't like the, the way it made me feel. I mean, I didn't like the, especially the next day. Cause I mean, if you drink alcohol and you get shit face drunk, you don't feel very good the next day. So I didn't like this, the the whole aspect of alcohol. I don't like the feeling of being buzzed out of my mind while I'm consuming it. I don't like the, the hangover feeling of it the next day either. So I, I was never a fan of it. And 
I finally, I just, it was in 2011, I was getting ready for my last bodybuilding show. And I always, when I was getting ready for bodybuilding shows, part of my contest diet was I would, in addition to cutting out junk food and processed food and all that, I would cut out alcohol. Now, granted, it wasn't a lot of alcohol to begin with, but I'd cut it out. So I can remember it was in June of 2011. That was when I said, you know what, we're gonna, I'm going to stop uh, drinking alcohol because I'm diving down. I want to get ready for the show that was in November of 2011. So I cut it out in June, you know, went through my contest diet and everything else, competed in November. And after the contest was over, I said, you know what, I, I have no desire to, to drink. Like sometimes like after the show, we'd go to a, a nightclub or something and people would, oh, here, have a, have a beer or have a drink or something to celebrate. And I just said, no, I don't really, I don't really want to. So I just, I just drank water after the, the show was over. I didn't drink any alcohol. And it was just like, I don't crave it. I don't want it. And I just... Literally, it's been since 2011, so now that's that's seven and a half years <laughs> since I've had an alcoholic drink, and I don't miss it, don't crave it, and I'm, I have no reason to uh, to resort back to it. So, do I drink alcohol? Nope, not at all. Uh, as far as my thoughts on alcohol and fat loss, it's certainly not going to help. Put it that way. Now, th the reason for that is because when alcohol is in your system, it prevents your body from burning body fat. When you have alcohol in your system, your body has to metabolize that alcohol first before it's going to tap into burning, uh, you know, the, the the nutrients in your in your system, like the protein, the carbs, the fat that you have, like in your digestive tract, or stored body fat. Like when alcohol is in your system, that has to get metabolized first and burnt before you're going to tap into burning the food calories you have or the body fat calories that you have. So that's where the whole idea of a beer belly and all this comes about. I mean, if somebody's regularly drinking and they, al they have alcohol in their system on a regular basis, well, they're preventing fat burning while the alcohol is in their system. So if you are going to drink, I would rather you do it sporadically. So like instead of having a few drinks every day and like literally hindering your fat loss every day, have you know a few drinks on the weekend or something like that and try and keep it sporadic. And another thing that I would recommend is try and minimize the damage done by drinking less alcohol. And one of the strategies that I used to use back when I would go out for a few social drinks is um, when, when you're out with friends and, and the peer pressure, like everybody is trying to force you to drink, like here, have a drink, have a drink, let me buy you a drink or, or whatever it is. You know, there's always that pressure to drink. So I always found if I didn't have a glass in my hand, people would be pressuring me to drink. So my strategy was to always have a glass in my hand. But the thing is, there wasn't always alcohol in that glass. So my first one might be uh, a beer or an alcoholic drink or whatever. I would have something like that. And then my next one, it might be, uh, you know, just a, a glass of water, right? Or it might be a, a glass of, uh, back then I was actually drinking soda, uh, which I've since cut that out as well. But I'd, sometimes it'd just be a plain soda with no alcohol in it whatsoever. And I'd probably go through it in that fashion, like one alcoholic drink, one soda, one glass of water, and then I'd have another alcoholic drink and I'd go through it in that fashion. So if I had six drinks over the course of the night, maybe only two of those drinks had any alcohol in them. So people would always see me with the glass in my hand and I'd be laughing and carrying on and, and having fun and fitting in. So everybody said, oh, Lee's drinking, when in reality, i most of the glasses of drink that I was having didn't have any alcohol in them at all, but I'd always have that glass there as my little social proof so people wouldn't be trying to bug me to drink, if that makes sense. I mean, if, if you have friends and you're experiencing peer pressure when you're out like that, you can probably relate to what I'm talking about. But that's what I used to do, and that was my strategy for minimizing alcohol consumption while still fitting into a social setting like that. Now, if I go out, I don't give a shit what anybody says to me. I say, look, I, I don't drink and I, I don't, you, you can't force it in me. <laughs> I just, right. And if you try to force it in me, then that might be the end of our friendship. <laughs> I've seriously, I've, I've lost a lot of friends over the years who were only friends over drinks. And I, I just kind of reevaluated my life and I said, like, do I really need to have this person in my life if the only reason we ever get together is to drink? And I'm like, if, if. If that's our only connection is to get together over drinks, then I really don't need that person in my life. So I've kind of upgraded my friends to higher quality people that I want to associate with for higher level reasons. So sometimes you'll see that too. You might have to upgrade your social network in order to uh, progress to higher levels. I and mean, that's kind of a, a different topic, but 
that's what I've done myself. So it's a lot of my quote unquote drinking buddies from back in my younger days. I don't associate with them anymore because that was the only thing we had in common. All right. Well, with that being said, I'm going to get ready and clue it up. I know I've gone well over the hour, which I usually do. All right. I, I, I always say I'm going to do the video chat for an hour, but I more often than not over deliver. That's just the way it is. So hopefully you enjoyed this one. I know we have uh, several people tuned in for this whole chat, which I do appreciate. And I'm going to clue it up again. As always, I will have the replay posted up with the timestamps to all the different topics we covered here uh, posted within the next 24 hours. So you can go ahead and, and check that out. I know a lot of people do prefer to watch the replays just due to scheduling or whatever. So you can look forward to seeing that within the next 24 hours. And if you would like some help with your own training and nutrition program, I know a lot of people were asking specific questions about their own situation. If you would like some help with this, you have two options. You can download the Total Fitness Bodybuilding app and you can contact me through the app. There's an Ask Lee section in the app as well as a direct contact form, which co comes to me personally. It, it, the contact form on the app actually comes directly to my cell phone so that I'll be able to communicate with you back and forth through there. So you can get in touch with me through the app. Uh, again, it's available through uh, at the Apple Store or the iTunes as well as Android through Google Play. So you can download that. Or if you want, you can send me an email at leeh at leehayward.com and we can you know, arrange a time to chat and discuss the strategy that works the best for you. So those are two ways you can get in contact with me if you would like more information. And with that being said, I'm going to clue it up. Have yourself a great day. Have yourself a fantastic weekend. And I'll talk to you next Friday. Take care. Over and out.